All right. Hello, everyone. It's kind of a weird situation. You can see me, I hope. I can't because the light is right in my eyes. So I don't even know how many people are in the room. But I do hope there is enough people I'm talking to. <laughs> All right. Welcome. Um, my name is Milen Jankov. I'm super happy to, well, see you as a bit of an overstatement uh, here today. Uh, and uh, I'll be talking to you about a thing called location transparency, which may or may not come as a surprise to you. Maybe you're familiar with the term, maybe you're not. If not, I hope you're going to learn something new. And I uh, certainly hope to provoke you to think about things uh, in, a, in a sense of, uh, in a context of how do we design applications, how do we migrate from these bad monoliths, bad quote-unquote, um, into uh, the beautiful land of microservices and, and stuff like that. Um, I work for Exonic. Exonic is a company that uh, deals with, it is a vendor that produces Java, mainly Java-based software, which helps developers implement architectural patterns like domain-driven design, event sourcing, and command query separation. Um, and we'll get into that a little bit later, just a little introduction so you know where my background is. Been a software developer for quite a while, dealing with developer relations these days, mostly trying to bridge the gap between the technologies that built the frameworks and the people like you who uh, use them. And this is my house. Uh, it is uh, where I live uh, with my kids and my wife. Uh, kids are very happy. It's in the central place of the city. They have clothes to school. They can go to parties. So they're super excited about it. My wife is not. Uh, she is more of a seaside uh, person. She, she likes the sea. She wants to live by the sea. So what we did is we split the house and moved part of it on the seaside. So she now can live on the seaside. Uh, and... Um, and that, that makes her extremely happy. The kids are still happy because they're, you know, they have all the conveniences they look for. Me, on the other hand, I'm more of a mountain person. So I always wanted to have a nice, beautiful house somewhere high in the mountains. So we took another piece of the house, moved it into the mountains. This is where I live. Uh, and now everyone's happy. You know, we kind of split into uh, the most convenient ways for everyone. Uh, the only problem is we need to drive to, you know, do a family dinner and stuff. But that's not a big deal, right? Did you buy that story? I mean, okay, I'll tell you one that you will buy. Here is my application. It was a nice, beautiful, monolithic application. But at the end of the day, I was like, nah, that's not the way I want it. So I took a part of it and run it independently. And then I took another part of it, and then I run it independently. And now I have a beautiful microservices. I also implemented a way for them to communicate nicely uh, between each other. So now I have a very nice distributed modular microservices style application. Did you buy that story? Much easier, isn't it? Okay, because that's what you don't see behind the scenes. You know, all these interrelationships going on between all these modules, that's so easy to, you know, not think about it when we just draw pictures, diagrams, and, and, and stuff. So why? Why it is that when I tell you the story about the house, you can immediately sense it's a nonsense. And when I tell you a story about an, a software application, so I bet some of you are like, yeah, that's doable, right? Why? Well, I would argue it has something to do with coherence. And that's a term we often use in software engineering. But what I think is happening is we human beings have natural sensors for coherence when it comes to the object of real life. We can sense immediately something in, in, in a real life scenario is incoherent. It doesn't just, it just doesn't feel right. And we kind of don't uh, have that for software, uh, right? So what is coherence? Coherence is essentially having uh, things that make sense to be together. Think about traveling by any transport train in this picture. It, it, it makes absolutely, uh, it's obviously for everyone that when you travel, there has to be a room for you to 
sit or stand, and there has to be a room for your luggage. Now imagine that you want to travel and they basically say, no hand luggage, all your belongings are going to you know, another train, and then you're going to collect them at the arrival. It, it immediately feels like, no, we, you know, me and my belongings will travel together, right? Or if they ask you to put your coat in a different train, it just immediately rings a bell. There's something wrong in here. You, you just don't cut it in there. Like this too, there, there is a coherence why you want to do this thing, uh, why, why we want these things to be together, right? But what we talk about in software engineering often is not coherence, is coupling. And now coupling is a little bit different. If you look into how uh, the train cars are connected together, well, they're coupled, right? But the reason they're coupled together is for having a single engine to be able to transport multiple of those cars, uh, right? It, you could theoretically split them apart, put an engine in front of each of any one of those, and then they will still do the exact same job, right? It, it's just we couple them in a long train because of performance reasons, optimizations, whatever, uh, whatever the actual reason is, it just makes, makes it easier to implement, makes it easier to manage things. It, it is not dictated by a coherence. It doesn't have to be this way. It can be a different way. We just choose to do it this way because we figured it's, it's, it's better for some reason. Now, there is another term that doesn't appear quite that often in software engineering, and that's kinescence. And kinescence, uh, at least the first time I saw that word, was in that book, The Fundamentals of Object-Oriented Design in UML by Mailer P. Jones. And what is a kinescence? A kinescence is when you have two or more objects that share a common life cycle. They are born together, they live together, and they die together, for whatever reason. And if you have these types of things, then you st you talk about we talk about the thing that there is a connaissance between the objects. They have to exist and and live together for for whatever reason. Now, let's look at this cut. And now I'm gonna I thought I'm gonna use a pointer, but I can't. It's too far. I hope I'm not gonna fall. <clears throat> look at this cut code. code. Um, it's a fairly, like, probably the simplest code you could, you could uh, imagine. It's a ticket purchasing uh, system, and so you have this thing called ticket, uh, and uh, you buy a ticket for an attraction. Uh, and do you see any connaissance in here? Let me help you out. There is a connaissance between these two. You can't change one without changing the another. And this is what's known as a connaissance of name. And it's also the thing that none of us cares about because these days we use IDEs and we have refactoring tools and you know, they do the job for us, right? Oh, back in my Pascal five days, you would actually have to go and change all this by hand and it was a pain. Uh, but nowadays no one pays attention um, too much uh, on those things. But that doesn't change the fact there is a connaissance of name in there. There's another one, can you spot it? There's a connaissance of type. You cannot change the type of the uh, function argument without uh, changing the, actual, the type of the thing that you pass in. Every time you change the type in one place, you have to change the type of another place. Again, that's something very easy uh, these days to do because most IDEs, most uh, tools that we use can do this for us, so we don't even think about it. That's why connaissance of type and connaissance of name are typically the, uh, what, we, what we call low, lower connaissance. It is like very uh, easy, connaissance that's very easy to deal with. But consider this code. I'm going to look at this screen now because it's too far from me. So in here, you're purchasing a, 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 a ticket for multiple attractions, one of which is the main attraction. And you have a piece of code that is actually doing this, and you execute that code. Do you see any connections in here? 
Let me help you. There is a connaissance of an algorithm or connaissance of convention, if you will. And that relates to the fact that that function or that method assumes that the first parameter is the main attraction. Should you change that assumption or should you change that algorithm, every single piece of code that executes that needs to change as well. Right? Or you can try to mitigate that by explicitly providing the first argument as a main attraction and then a list of all the other attractions that you purchase. Now, what you're dealing with is a connaissance of position. Right? When you call, you still have to remember that the first argument is the one that, uh, uh, that is the main attraction. If you want to change that order, you have to change algorithm or, uh, or the, uh, the, the order of processing things. So those are just a few examples. There's a lot more ty of types of connaissance. There's connaissance of uh, execution. There's connaissance of timing. Uh, there's a connaissance of identity, when like, two things have to reference the same object, otherwise things break. Uh, and, and, uh, and there is one even more important that is, con that is called contranescence. With contranescence, you typically deal with the fact that you cannot name a variable with a name that another variable already uses. So you don't think about it, but that is a limitation. The fact that you've already used a name prevents you from using it for something else. Uh, right? So that's a, a contra in essence. So we discussed a little examples of, of connaissance. And now the question is, so we, we have connaissance. There's no way around it. It exists. It will always be there. The question is, what causes it? Is it coherence or is it coupling? Right? So in this book, which you may or may not be familiar with, um, uh, Eric Evans introduced the term aggregate. So in domain-driven design, you have this thing called aggregate, which basically is uh, a group of objects which are treated as a single entity, if you will, or single, uh, a single item with respect to changes. So every time you want to you wanna change something, it, you have to do it within the boundaries of an aggregate. The, the aggregate defines um, uh, like the things that are interconnected in a variety of different ways, but outside, it appear, it, even though it's a collection of objects, out for the outside world, it appears as a, as a single unit. And if you compare that to the definition of coherence, you can see quite a lot of similarities. So it is the, the idea of having boundaries and the idea of forming unified thing and the idea that internally can be complicated, but it's one thing from the, for the outside world. There's quite a lot of, of, of uh, common uh, thinking in, in those two terms. So when you have an aggregate, uh, if you design your applications this way, to have an aggregate and the code and the objects inside the aggregate are free to have higher connaissance. You can have connaissance of algorithm there, you can have connaissance of whatever you want, because it doesn't matter. They live, uh, they live their life together, always. Right? They, they are born together, they die together, and they live together. Right? So whichever connections are in there, they likely have to be maintained during the life cycle. Now, you can have another uh, aggregate or not, or object or group of object that can introduce the same. Internally, it has a lot of um, a high level connections, um, uh, and it defines a boundary for the outside world. What you want to have is a lower uh, uh, connections when it comes to communicating between those two. If you introduce a high connaissance in between those objects, that would be likely a nightmare to maintain down the road. So how do you do that? Well, the way those two communicate is by exchanging some data in between the two, right? And if you can ensure that that data is uh, the only connaissance that exists for that piece of data is connaissance of name, and connections of type, which are easy to fix with refactoring, then you're good to go, right? So you should avoid all other 
more complicated types of connections. Well, there goes the arrows. The thing that we commonly overlook when, you, when we um, uh, uh, draw diagrams like this is these tiny little arrows, which makes the assumption that magically things connect to each other and exchange data, and it all you know, somehow automagically work. Now, connaissance of location is not something that's in the original book, but it's something that I argue it exists. And now, let me try to explain to you what I mean by that. Look at that code. Again, fairly simple code. Now, what you have here is an, a, a name of a function and a call to that function. And you may not think about it, but in that particular code, there is an assumption that the function and the call are in the same class. Now, think about it. There is a constraint that they have to be in the same class. Otherwise, that's not going to work. If you try to move that function in a different class, it will break. OK, but then you can, imp you know, you can put it in a different class and then call it you know, with the class name. And Java can do that. Come on. right? OK, now in this particular example, the assumption behind that code is that both are in the same package. If you put it in a different package, it's not going to work. OK, we can fix that, import statements, yeah, come on, basic Java, right? Well, then you are under the assumption that both live on the same class path or module path, depends on which version of Java you use. So there is an assumption behind that, and that, that constrains you. That, that there is an assumption about the location of the thing. Right, OK, we can fix that. Let's go fully, full-blown distributed, and we're just going to do RESTful services all the way down. Uh, right? So we now have a, uh, a, a client and a, uh, a server, and the server exposes something, and the client reaches out. You now have a connaissance of configuration. You have to configure those two things at the same way. If you change the way the uh, the location of that RESTful service, all your clients have to go and change, right? Yeah, I know there's tons of you know uh, um, uh, discovery solutions out there, and, and and just think about why, right? But yeah, but we can even fix that, um, and we can go to. Uh, okay, there's another connaissance, which is the, you know, uh, by, this is a connaissance by name. Uh, and that's for the uh, path, uh, and eventually the port, and whatever else uh, uh, there is. But if you want to fix that, let's go fully event-driven. So we utilize something like Kafka or any other message bus, and then we have a message producer and a message consumer, and then we just send messages, and we receive messages, and we're totally uh, like independent of each other, right? Well, not entirely, because what happens if you change the name of the topic? Now you have actually connections between three things, a producer, a consumer, and a topic name. And no matter which one of those three change, uh, changes, the other two has to change. Right? So all that is to say that in one way or another, when doing this, you have to be aware of the location, or your application has to be aware of the location. Right? You may not think about it this way, but there is uh, an implicated in awareness of the location. So how can we fix that? Is there, uh, if, if we agree there is a connaissance of location, is there anything we can do about it? Well, let's think about that data piece, right? And that is, in, in, in particular, in event-driven systems, you would not call that data, you would call it event. Uh, but I argue, let's call it a message. And let's talk, not talk about event-driven, but talk about message-driven. So now you have systems that exchange messages. Right? And theoretically, that should solve the problem, except messages are too, too abstract themselves. Like, what is a message? Now, I argue we should look into messages and try to differentiate a different type of message, different types of messages that have slightly different characteristics. Namely, commands, events, and queries. Now, if you think about it, those are all messages. One system sends it to another system. That's what they have in common. 
But other than that, there's quite a lot of differences going on there. So first of all, if the message is a command, which is you ask someone to do something, you typically route it to a single handler. You don't send it to everyone out there. You, you send it to someone who can actually handle that request. right? And most likely, you would want to receive some sort of confirmation. Uh, you know, at least you care to know whether there is someone who, uh, who can handle that or not. Right? Uh, so when, you, when we speak about events, well, events is basically a notification that something has happened. So you just send it out there. And you don't really know uh, who's going to receive it, who's not going to receive it. You don't really care to get any response uh, for that. So it's just fire and forget. Right? Now, think about queries. Queries are quite the opposite of those two. Actually, the most important thing about queries is getting back the result. Right? So you, you may route it to one or more recipients, you may aggregate the results from multiple recipients, but at the end of the day, what you care to receive it is the response. That is what has a business value to you. Right? So we now have three message types which differ quite a lot in, how, in, in, in the way they are routed and the way they are processed. Uh, whether you want a confirmation or not, uh, whether you deliver them to a single recipient or not, uh, that is, that is all, uh, that, that's how they differ in, uh, between each other. So let's try to model that. Uh, so in this example here, we'll model our uh, messages as simple pages, plain old Java objects. Um, so we have a, a, a piece of code that is a command, a piece of code, and it, 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 does, it just has some data. A piece of code that is an event. And a piece of code that is a query, and the query is a little bit different because it also specifies what type of a result we expect from, uh, from that query. And then what you need, if you want to do this, is some sort of a message router that has a basic understanding of these three types of messages. So far, you're familiar with probably, if you've been in the industry long enough, about enterprise service buses that did you know, heavily inspect your messages and had some logic. And yeah, it, after so many years of using it, we decided it's a bad idea. And you are used with the, um, uh, uh, what is it called? Um, uh, smart endpoints, dumb pi pipes, or or whatever the thing is, uh, which is basically just routing messages left and right without even looking into what, uh, uh, what's in there. So what, what would be helpful, in my opinion, is if you had a message router that has just enough intelligence to be able to differentiate those three types of messages, there are three different routing patterns, and just adjust the routing based on the type of the, uh, of the message. So, on one hand, you have the producers that create those and send them. And here is an example code now that uses this thing called command gateway, query gateway, and event gateway. So for now, just assume that is a magic object of, uh, that your message router gives you. And what you can do is you can just say, I'm sending a command here, and pff, your command is in there. I'm sending an event and I'm sending a query, and I expect that response from that query. Now, how do, what happens then? Then it goes to this uh, message router, and the message router can know whether that's a command query or, um, uh, or um, event, and act accordingly. Well, how, that, how, how we will know, though? Well, we need to instruct it. And so there is a consumer side configuration, again, for your magic message routing thing, that basically registers objects as handlers. And you can say, I am a query handler, I am a command handler, and I am an um, event handler. And not only that, but I also know which types of events or queries or commands I can handle. Be because we now have defined those as explicit types, it's very easy to be say, that type of command, I can handle it. That type of query, I can provide your result for that. Right? So you have this, this ability to register your handlers uh, based on what 
uh, the, what the type of message is uh, and, and, and provide uh, some action in that component. How does that sound to you? Because this is exactly what we do at Exonic. Um, and this is the, the concept that we try to bring to developers, and it's called Accent Framework. And it's an open source Java, JVM language framework, so you can use it with any Java, JVM language. Uh, we're currently working on versions for um, uh, other languages, but right now it's uh, like 100% uh, JVM uh, oriented. And it essentially does this. It has the notion of the three types of messages. It can understand those. And it can provide you the, the routing patterns for those types of messages. And it also can provide you the mean to subscribe um, uh, for, uh, sorry, to uh, register consumers. And it also provides you those gateways or buses, if you will, and we have both, um, that you can use uh, to send messages, right? And so that is what we call a location transparency. Now you can do that because you, the only thing you need to know is that from a producer perspective is that you're sending a command or a query or, or an event, and that's it. The location of the consumer, it's not a concern to you, right? And the same time, on, on the other side, you're registering yourself as a uh, uh, handler of a command, query, or event, but who sends it and where it comes from is not a concern to you. So that gives you a location transparency, and now you, what you can do you can have a higher connaissance within your aggregates or components because they need to live together, because they need to be coherent, and because of a million other business reasons. But you have a very low connaissance in communication part between those. Essentially, the connaissance is down to uh, connaissance of name and connaissance of type. And so you can have this in a single deployment unit. Uh, you can build this as a monolithic application, and it still follows those principles. But now, when you are about to uh, scale that up and you want to split it, what you can do is you can actually have something in the middle that can work distributed uh, in a distributed environment, such as another products that we have, Axon Server or Axon Cloud, Axonic Cloud, and all of a sudden you can have these very same components without changing a single line of code in them, working in a distributed environment because they follow the same location transparent principle. They communicate through messages. Uh, but the message routing part only understands the types of messages and the delivery patterns, and the components will interact with each other in a very, very same way, regardless of whether they're deployed in a single monolithic application or in a uh, distributed um, uh, microservices-style um, application. So what Axon Server is, Axon Server is essentially two things. It's a message router, and it's an event store. So the, I'm not talking about this in this talk, but if you want to do event sourcing, for example, Axon Server is also the thing that you may want to look into it because it also understands another thing that comes out of the differentiation between those three types of events is that commands and queries are typically disposable. Once those are handled, you don't really need to know what, you don't need to, to keep them around. You can, but they don't serve any purpose. But events are quite the opposite. If you want to do event sourcing, you want to store the events, and you want to do um, so that later on you can build the states of your objects from these past events, or you can use it to a variety of uh, analytics um, and, and, and all, kinds of, uh, all kinds of things. So another thing Axon Server is, is an event store, a highly efficient one, by the way. Uh, uh, it has a linear performance. So comparing to storing this in a database, databases tends to, do, to degrade performance uh, over time. We're talking about millions and billions of events. Uh, and Axon Server is pretty much linear. Um, and I can, uh, I can prove that to you off stage if you, if you really are interested. But anyways, Axonic Cloud is essentially Axon Server in the cloud if you wanna, uh, if you wanna try it out. Axon Server is not open source as a, as a um, 
a typical open source license, but it's free to use. Um, uh, it has a standard edition version that is um, uh, uh, free to use, and you can download it and, and, and use it any way you wish. Uh, and a Sonic uh, Cloud has a free tire if you want to try it out. Um, so that's basically uh, uh, the bottom line of this. Uh, it is uh, what we try to do to help developers is to provide a framework uh, that uh, helps you implement domain-driven design, event sourcing, and secure as in Java. Uh, and if you've done any of those, chances are you've already heard about us because there's not a lot of solutions in that space in Java land. Uh, and then Axon Server and Axonic Cloud, as I mentioned, as a uh, message routing and a um, you know, event stores. That's all I have for you for today. I hope it was interesting. I hope uh, you learned something. Uh, let me know what do you think about uh, about that idea? If it's any useful for you, or you know, if you believe it should uh, um, it should not work for some reason, I'm also happy to hear that. Any any arguments, both sides um, uh, are more than welcome. Uh, on the right, there's some links about uh, other resources in case you want to learn more, including our academy where we have some free courses about domain-driven design, event sourcing, and, and secure as. Um, if, if you are interested in those topics with Java and JVM languages, uh, make sure to check this out. I think now I'm going to open it for questions. Thank you again very much for joining this talk, and I'll uh, try to answer your questions now. I, I can't see. Oh, here you go. Hey, it, do you? Do you uh, batteries. If you have a question, then shout. I'll repeat it for the recording. I don't see any hands. Ah, oh, there is a hand. Here you go. Uh, okay, so the question is, I mentioned performance is good, and how do we compare it to Kafka? So we don't, first of all, directly compare it to Kafka because Kafka is not an event store. Kafka is a, a event uh, routing uh, or message distribution thing, uh, whatever you want to call it, but it, it's not an event store. So maybe I need to clarify the performance I was referring to was the performance of the event store. So normally when you do event sourcing and, and you store lots of events, uh, you will see a degraded performance over time. And you know, if you have uh, 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 10 events and you construct the state of your object from 10 events, that's another story. If you have to construct it from, uh, like, I don't know, billions of events, that's yet another story. So comparing to solutions that store data, such as databases, ver ver uh, whether um, uh, um, SQL or NoSQL uh, databases, um, we have a linear performance where their performance degrades. And the reason is not because they're worse solutions. They weren't meant to do these things. They were meant to allow you to update and remove and um, uh, and, uh, uh, and change and modify the data, whereas event store is immutable by nature, so it, it is append only. So then all this stuff that databases need to do in order to provide their core functionality, uh, right, we don't have to do. Right, so we only append, which allows us to have a linear performance comparing to pretty much any other generic purpose databases. So. Let's not confuse it, like Axon, uh, Axon Server is not a general purpose storage, right? If you want to use it as a general purpose storage, uh, any databases will beat us, and well, actually, it will be impossible for you to do the things you would normally do with the general purpose storage. But when it comes down to storing events, then it is, it's probably the most performant uh, solution that you can have in, in the Java space right now. I'm sorry, I don't know if that answered your question. But, uh, all right. Uh, anything, anyone else? Yeah, here you go. Uh, uh, yeah, I can hear you. Uh, so, 
again, that depends on the type of the message. So if it is a command, it is guaranteed that's one, exactly one's delivery, right? If it is an event, uh, basically that also depends a little bit of how, whether you are or a local or uh, a re, or a distributed environment, right? And uh, because the other thing that is uh, that I guess I should have mentioned is that if you run this in a local environment, even though you're still thinking about messages, there is no serialization and deserialization. It's essentially like a Java call uh, in, in behind the scenes, uh, right? So so then it is it is immediate. Now if you but, but it is also stored in the event store, right? So in that sense, it is uh, just one delivery. But what you can do at any point of time is you can, at any of your consumers, you can say, because normally you have a um, a, talk, um, uh, look, uh, uh, how is it called? Um, a token which tells you where are in the queue, right? So at any time you can just say, remove that token and go read all the events uh, again. Uh, right. So for the events, you have the ability to go back in time and go through the entire list and re, uh, reapply them anytime you want. For commands and queries, that's one time. You, at the moment you respond, that's it. That's gone. Right. So it, it, for those, it does guarantee one, uh, one time delivery. But then again, you can uh, there can be errors. Uh, uh, all right. And that's another thing that how this differs from Kafka, for example, is that you don't just send things on a topic and hope someone's going to get it. That's the case for events, but for commands, if you try to send the command and the platform knows there is no command handler, you are actually going to get an exception, uh, which is going to tell you no one is there to handle your command. Uh, right? So then you have the ability to do something more, uh, um, uh, you know, send another command or whatever is your business operation. Uh, do we, I don't know if we have time for a question. Yeah, okay, still have time. Uh, I'm not sure if I see a hand there. No. Okay, here you go. Interesting. So uh, I got that question in a different form than shape. So the, let me repeat the question. Um, uh, I was talking about connections of location, and the con and the question is, didn't I just replace that with the connections uh, of uh, framework? So if let me let me reverse the question. Would you be asking me that if I instead of accent framework or accent server were showing you Kafka in the middle? Um, could you repeat the last sentence? I didn't get that one. Name and look, uh, name and type, yeah. Okay, so the question is, uh, it, it appears to you that it's always going to be three, the connections of name and type and, and something else. Um, so it's hard to argue with that. I mean, that depends on, I, I, I personally don't see it this way. Because for uh, uh, that big, like, so we're talking about connections in terms of um, uh, functionality versus using libraries. So if you include using third party libraries, into that being a connaissance, then you're right, right? But we do this all the time, anytime, right? You choose Spring Framework, is that a connaissance? You choose Quarkus, you choose, I don't know, Elasticsearch, you choose a database, you know, the reality is none of us is able to build today a meaningful application without using any third party code, right? So if you, if you want, and I, I hear that a lot from a lot of people, like purifying your code. Well, I get the intention, and I, you know, on an intention level, I tend to agree with it. But the reality is, unless you want to build it all yourself, including, I don't know, the, the databases and the socket connections and whatnot, uh, right? You can't. You, for some parts of your stuff, you're going to have to rely on third-party libraries. Now. Yeah, you can argue that introduces another connaissance, 
Um, but it, it, it's a choice. I would say it's more of a, a coupling uh, uh, that comes for convenience. Uh, it, it's not necessarily something that your domain model imply, uh, 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 demands, right? Theoretically, you can change all of those at any time, right? It's just a matter of how, how big effort that is. All right, we are out of time. I'll be around for another hour or so before I catch my flight. So uh, if you have more questions, feel free to find me. I'm more than happy to talk to you. And let me know uh, any feedback you may have. I'll be more than happy to, uh, to, to hear it and to argue with you if you feel like. There is a coffee break now, so All right, I'll see you at the coffee break. Have a good day. Enjoy the rest of the conference. <laughs>